Hello students, now we already come to the fifth week of this semester and the fifth lesson title is Seven Churches and we will think about the seven churches and especially about Laodicean Church. Let's start with the prayer. Dear our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we come to study the Word of God. Uh, please uh, give us the power and grace of the Holy Spirit that we may understand and prepare and also teach other people um, about your messages. And we want to meet the Lord very soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, the first word is Antipas. According to Eastern Orthodox traditions and according to the commentary on the Apocalypse of Andreas of Caesarea, we thought about this person pretty much, right? It is believed that Saint Antipas was the Antipas referred to in the book of Revelation 2.13. So what it is saying is he was actually uh, a person, historical person who was living there. According to Christian tradition, John the Apostle ordained Antipas as Bishop of Pergamon during the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. The traditional account goes on to say Antipas was martyred during the reign of Nero by burning. The second word, Steve Moise, is a visiting professor at Newman University, United Kingdom, and author of the Old Testament in the Book of Revelation, uh, published in 1995 by Sheffield in the Old Testament in the New uh, in 2001. He is the series editor of the TNT Clark Approaches to Biblical Studies. He is a very well-known revelation scholar, especially studying uh, Old Testament in the Book of Revelation. And he one time visited Andrew Seminary too, uh, and I was listening to him, but anyways, he is not an Adventist, and he has different ideas about the Book of Revelation from us. Here is his picture and the book cover, the Old Testament in the Book of Revelation by Steve Moise. Third word, seven churches. The seven churches of Revelation, also known as the seven churches of the Apocalypse, the seven churches of Asia are seven major churches of early Christianity as mentioned in the New Testament book of Revelation. All of them are located in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. They are the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The churches in this context refers to the community or local congregations of Christians living in each city at that time. But, of course, the message is um, universal or historical. This is the map of the seven churches. Uh, this is the present-day Turkey, right? And here is Istanbul, Istanbul there, right? And these are the seven churches, and Patmos was here. Laodicea. The Laodicean church was a Christian community established in the ancient city of Laodicea, on the river Lycus, in the Roman province of Asia, in one of the early centers of Christianity. The church was established in the Apostolic Age, the earliest period of Christianity, and is probably best known as the last of the seven churches of Asia 
introduced by me in the book of Revelation. So it, it is the last church. Laodicea means justice or judgment of the people. Laos means people and BK means justice or judgment. So we can say uh, judgment of the people or we can say judged people or justice of the people. Yeah. And that is the meaning of Laodicea. DG Modernism is a book title actually by the British cultural critic Alan Kirby. It is a term that describes a new paradigm of authority and knowledge formed under the pressure of new technologies and contemporary social forces. Uh, digital natives is a related term. Uh, digital natives are those who were born after the widespread adoption of digital technology, often referring to millennials, Generation Z and Generation Alpha, they can consume digital information quickly and comfortably through devices and platforms such as computers and mobile phones and also the SMS systems, right? Digital natives. I am not a digital native. I wonder whether any one of you are born in that age, born with a smartphone. The sixth term is scientific positivism. Positivism is an empiricist philosophical theory that holds that all genuine knowledge is either true by definition or positive. Modern positivism was first articulated in the early 19th century by August Comte. I read, generally positivists attempted to introduce scientific methods to their respective fields. They believed the scientific method must replace metaphysics in the history of thought. So they were very um, positive about the scientific development and also scientific method and very, very positive about it and, and but uh, it rather led to Second World War and people became very disappointed about uh, scientific development afterwards because they thought by scientific development the utopia may arrive but it was uh, the opposite and became very disappointed. Subjectivism denotes the philosophical tenet that our own mental activity is the only unquestionable fact of our experience. The success of this position is attributed to Descartes. Descartes, Descartes. It has historically been condemned by Christian theologians, which oppose to it the objective authority of the church, the Christian dogma, and the revealed truth of the Bible. In subjectivism, the authority of church and Christian dogma and the truth of the Bible are uh, rejected somehow. They didn't uh, buy these things. That's why they were condemned. Metaphysical subjectivism is the theory that reality is what we perceive to be real. There is no underlying true reality that exists independently of perception. So it's almost that it's only in perception. The reality is only in your perception subjectively. Subjectivism. And relativism is very related to subjectivism. Relativism is a family of philosophical views which deny claims to be objectivity within a particular domain and assert that facts in that domain are relative to the perspective of an observer or the context in which they are assessed. 
Relativism is the view that every belief on a certain topic or perhaps about any topic is as good as every other. So in relativism, they say there is no absolute objective truth, and the truth is in the minds of the people as well. And um, also, as much as my view is right, your view is also right. That is relativism. Last generation theology, or final generation theology, is a religious belief regarding moral perfection achieved by sanctified people in the last generation before the second coming of Jesus. Some of the Adventists hold this view that there will be an end time remnant of believers who are faithful to God, which will be manifest shortly before the second coming of Jesus, as suggested by the 144,000 saints described in the book of Revelation of the New Testament. Uh, so this is the last generation theology, and that means there will be the remnant people who will be perfected before the second coming. Yeah. And um, about the advocates of this theology, we will think about during the class period. Here is a picture related to last generation theology. Uh, there is a uh, website, Last Generation for Christ, and they presented this book, God's Character and the Final Generation, and this was uh, presented in Spectrum Magazine uh, in 2019 under the title Defending Last Generation Theology. That was the article title, and it was surprisingly in Spectrum Magazine. And I think it's the book title, God's Character in the Final Generation. Modernism is both a philosophical movement and an arts movement that arose from broad transformations in Western society during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The movement reflected the desire for the creation of new forms of art, philosophy, a social organization which reflected the newly emerging industrial world, including features such as urbanization, new technologies, and war. Yeah. Modernism started together with in industrial development and urbanization, and uh, it was in late 19th century and early 20th century. After modernism comes postmodernism. Postmodernism is an intellectual stance or mode of discourse defined by an attitude of skepticism toward what it considers as the grand narratives and ideologies of modernism, as well as opposition to epistemic certainty and the stability of meaning. Claims to object facts are dismissed as naive realism in postmodernism. So there is no objective fact, objectivity in postmodernism. Postmodernism is characterized by self-referentiality, epistemological relativism, moral relativism, pluralism, irony, irrelevance, and eclecticism. Um, as much as I am good, you are also good. It's pluralism. And very interestingly, uh, pluralism somehow accommodates everything, every concept and ideas. But there is one exception that pluralism cannot accept, and that is there is absolute truth. Pluralism doesn't accept that part. <laughs> so 
even though it is pluralism, there is one exception in pluralism. Uh, if there is no pluralism, if you say, then they reject it, even though it accepts everything. Okay. Millennials, also known as Generation Y or Generation Y, yeah, are the demographic cohort following Generation X and preceding Generation Z, X, Y, Z, right? And X and Generation Y is millennials, and that comes, after that comes Generation Z. Researchers and popular media use the early 1980s as starting birth years and the mid-1990s to early 2000s as ending birth years with the generation typically being defined as people born from 1981 to 1996. Most millennials are the children of baby boomers and early generation Xers. Millennials are often the parents of generation alpha. Maybe after Z, it go, goes back to alpha. Here is the picture. Baby boomers or those who born between 1946 to 1964. And then comes generation X. And after it, millennials, that is generation Y and generation Z and then goes back to Generation Alpha early in 2010. Millennials uh, became about 20 years old when the year 2000 came, or they were born right before that year. These are the millennials from 1980, born from 1980 up to 1996. Are people, these people are called Generation Y or Millennials. Now we come to uh, an Adventist scholar, Emilio Mitchell. Yeah, I don't know how I should read this name, Mitch, Mitch, Emilio Mitch, yeah, was a Swiss born Adventist revivalist. His father was a Catholic and his mother was an Adventist. After immigrated to the United States and converted to Christianity, he was trained by the American preacher Billy Graham as a missionary and revivalist. However, he became an Adventist. Later, he became an Adventist and also authored various books, including The Gospel of Jesus Christ, and another one is Christ's message to the last generation. This is his photo. He was a pres president of Paris Conference, Conference of Paris. Yeah. And this is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, a people ready for the return of Jesus, Christ's message to the last generation. These are the series of books that he authored. Remnant, we think about these words because Laodicean church is the last church and the remnant church is the Laodicean church. In Seventh-day Adventist theology, there will be an end time remnant of believers who are faithful to God. The remnant church is a visible, historical, organized body characterized by obedience to the commandments of God and the possession of a unique end-time gospel proclamation called the Remnant Church. A distinct but related concept is the eschatological remnant, which will manifest shortly prior to the second coming of Jesus. The Remnant Church would be a catalyst for the formation of this eschatological remnant group. Okay, so, so what we need to understand here is um, everyone who belongs to the remnant church will not be the true remnant. What it means is every member 
Uh, to the Seventh Day Adventist Church, uh, will not be saved. In other words, so there will be an eschatological remnant, but they come from this remnant church. One hundred and forty-four thousand is a natural number. It has significance in various religious movements and ancient prophetic belief systems. The number 144,000 appears three times in the book of Revelation, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 two times. Some, taking the numbers symbolically, believe it represents all of God's people throughout history. Some take the number literally to be the end-time remnant people who will not experience death. And there are also other people who take them as the Jewish converts during the so-called seven-year tribulation. Um, this is in the, the last view, is in the dispensationalism. There will be Jewish converts who are forming 144,000 literally Jewish people, and they will uh, preach the end-time message during the last tribulation. Uh, but we don't go for this idea, but there are these two views, or three views, that all the people of God throughout history will be, is counted as 144,000, or the other people take this number literally, and they say this will be the end-time remnant people who will not experience death and will be translated into heaven to meet the second coming of Christ. Uh, we do not actually know for sure whether it's a symbolic number or a literal number, though individually you can have a preference, but the important thing is we need to be numbered among this. Uh, anyways, latter rain in the east and former rain in the east. The former rain falls at the sowing time. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate. The latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. So rain represents the Holy Spirit. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. And this is a citation from Testimonies to Ministers 506, and since it explains the letter, letter rain, I am quoting here, and you know there is the early rain and the letter rain, and early rain is for the sowing time, and the letter rain is for the harvest season. And we are waiting for the letter rain of the Holy Spirit for the final work of the gospel proclamation throughout the world, so-called the three angels' messages, or the present truth that we are uh, entrusted to proclaim at the last time. The seventh uh, term is sealing. Sealing is applying a seal to a document for authentication. You know the seal. Sometimes it's on the envelope, and you seal it so that people cannot open it, open the letter. That is called seal, right? And in the ancient times, also the seal was used to authenticate the document. The term sealing denotes a biblical term with which the pouring out or the working of the Holy Spirit is described in various places in the New Testament. The end time sealing is described in the book of Revelation. It will be just before probation closes. It will protect the faithful 
from the seven last plagues. So the sealing will protect the faithful people from the last seven plagues. The seal of God is in contrast to the mark of the beast. And uh, when you are sealed, you will be settled in the truth. That is the sealing. And um, this is a quotation uh, from G.D. Moskalar in Ministry Magazine. 2017 and we need to be sealed there will be only two kinds of people one is one group is the sealed people and the other group is the group who received the mark of the beast you are either you either receive the mark of the beast or the sealing of God and you of course need to be sealed by the truth of God by the Holy Spirit in our character and in our faith. Time of trouble, the phrase the time of trouble occurs only in Daniel 12, 1. Matthew 24, together with Luke 21 and Mark 13, refers to wars, earthquakes, famines, upheavals in nature, and other such crises the time of the end. Some vivid depictions of Earth's final afflictions appear in Apocalypse, that is Revelation. Jeremiah 37 mentions Jacob's trouble. It is when Christ shall cease his work as mediator in man's behalf, though their sins would be reminded. Jacob's in the Jacob's trouble, Though their sins would be reminded, their faith would not fail by remembering their sincere repentance in God's mercy. Yeah. Uh, Jacob's trouble can be explained this way. You will be agonized during the Jacob's trouble time, whether all of your sins are whether you repented all of your sins, because you still feel like you have sin and you are a sinner and you have sins and you are committing sins and you feel that way so you search your heart heart but actually you cannot find any sin that you didn't repent because of, of your sincere repentance and you depend on god's mercy you will be able to go through the jacob's trouble Okay. That's why um, Mrs. White very much emphasizes that you need to repent all the sins and give up every sin before the Jacob's trouble comes. Because in that time, Satan will attack you. That, um, you will be lost anyways. Satan will accuse you, you will be lost anyways because you committed this sin and this sin and this sin. But even in spite of that, you kind of uh, realize you have repented every sin. Otherwise, we will be truly lost through this tri tribulation and during the time of trouble. Number nine is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is a concept in Christian theology proposing that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to believers, that is, treated as if it were theirs through faith. The righteousness is ours through faith, that is, the imputed righteousness. It is on the basis of Jesus' righteousness that God accepts humans. This acceptance is also referred to as justification. It is, it is closely related to the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone. So justification is the imputed righteousness. And there is another one, imparted righteousness. Imparted righteousness is that gracious gift of God given at the moment of the new birth 
which enables a Christian disciple to strive for holiness and sanctification. Imputed righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus credited to the Christian, enabling the Christian to be justified, while imparted righteousness is what God does in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit after justification, working in the Christian to enable and empower the process of sanctification in Wesleyan thought. This is called Christian perfection. Uh, sanctification, the process of sanctification is called imparted. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is truly imparted to you, in you, that is imparted righteousness, uh, while imputed righteousness is the Christ's righteousness is imputed on you by justification. Here is a very nice quotation by Ellen White. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. This quotation is from the Faith and Work, page 5. And this, this, you can find this picture online as well. So, uh, now we have thought about the 20 uh, terms and words which occurs which occur in the fifth lesson guide. Yeah. We will think about the seven churches, Laodicean churches, and what it implies to be in the Laodicean church during the class time. Thank you so much. We will meet you on Sunday at 9.30. Bye.